distinguished fellow, uh, David Heyman. Um, this week, the Institute is marking its centenary with a series of special events. And the guest schedule for today um, is Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyes as the Director General of the World Health Organization, who needs little introduction, I'm sure. Um, un unfortunately, we've just heard uh, moments ago that um, something urgent has come up at WHO and Dr. Tedros would not be able to join us for the duration of the webinar. Um, we're hoping he'll be able to join us for some of it, but we are still uh, waiting to hear. So I apolog apologies for that, uh, most unfortunate, but we are going to carry on nonetheless. And there's lots that um, David and I can cover in this for you and your questions on um, some of the same aspects, as well as some of the new uh, science that is emerging around the um, outbreak. Uh, David, I thought maybe uh, we could start with you situating us as to where you think we are with the pandemic now and what the outlook is for the next year or two. Well, thanks, Emma. Um, as you know, there's quite a bit that's been learned already. And this has really helped in getting the world to where it is today at a point where the virus has been suppressed in most countries in Europe, North America, uh, the Middle East and Asia, but it's still increasing in Latin America. And in Africa, there's really a question as to what's happening there because it hasn't yet manifested itself in the same way as it has in other parts of the world. So we're seeing that overall, um, the um, efforts that countries have made have done quite a bit in suppressing virus transmission. And now countries are exiting from that and have a, a series of questions as to what they need to do going forward. Countries certainly want to keep the virus suppressed, the transmission suppressed in the short term and keep that heavy burden of patients out of hospitals. But there are some questions which are not yet answered that would help in understanding what the future will hold. And that includes whether or not there will be a vaccine, whether or not the immunity that occurs um, after infection of this virus is an immunity which lasts and which protects and is it an immunity caused by antibodies in the blood or by cells, special cells called T cells, which are, are not manifested in the antibodies that are produced in the, in the blood. So questions like that continue, um, but still the world has done a remarkable job in facing this outbreak. If there were to be one common error that's been made, it's been that countries have assumed that this would transmit and be the same as an influenza pandemic. And it clearly is not. This virus causes discrete outbreaks. Contact tracing or track and trace as it's called in the UK is important to continue throughout the strategies of dealing with this virus, as well as trying to shield those populations at greatest risk, which include people in care homes, which include the elderly, and those with comorbidities. So we've learned a lot. We're lacking certain tools to go forward. And what we hope is that those tools will become available. But in the meantime, we can still do a lot to keep virus transmission low while we're waiting to see the destiny of this virus. Remember, Zika virus is disappeared from populations at present. Other viruses act in different ways. The HIV virus emerged and continued long-term and other viruses have various epidemiologies. So we just need to see the destiny of this. And in the meantime, make sure that countries are doing the maximum effort they can to suppress transmission. But how would, should we position ourselves now? Should we be looking at, we've got to learn how to live with this for the next year or two, three, um, or do we just say, who knows what can happen? What, what do we need to be doing to position ourselves to cope and get ourselves through this? Well, as much as I think we'd all like to say we can count on a vaccine being available next year that can be used in the high risk populations and we can then get on with life as usual. That's what we would all like to be able to say, but there's no evidence that that vaccine will be effective, long-term immunity and available. In fact, Tony Fauci the other day had said that if a vaccine is shown to be effective, it may not have a long lasting immunity and that would require re-vaccination of populations at regular intervals. What's in favor of this is that this virus is an RNA virus, as is the virus that causes influenza. 
that this virus mutates less frequently. There's some type of a control mechanism at the molecular level, which prevents this virus from mutating as rapidly as does the flu virus. You remember the flu virus needs a new vaccine each year. This virus doesn't mutate in that manner. And so if there is an effective vaccine, it probably wouldn't need to be modified regularly as has to be the uh, seasonal influenza vaccine. So we need to get on with doing what we can with the tools we have. We know how to diagnose this infection. We know how to contain small outbreaks when they occur to prevent community transmission. And we know that sometimes we may need to uh, suppress the virus by, by closing down certain sectors and then opening them up again, as we've seen in Asia. Okay, thank you for that. I, I do want to come on to uh, two uh, news pieces today that I can imagine might um, be keeping Tedros from this call. Um, one is the Donald Trump's uh, notification that he's started the official withdrawal from WHO. What would really happen if they did withdraw? What is the reality of what that means? Well, first of all, Emma, I would say that as an American, because my career has been through the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta based overseas, I'm very disappointed that the U.S. would even be considering withdrawing from an organization which has benefited the U.S. and countries around the world. That's my first statement, and I have to, I have to claim um, bias because I'm an American citizen and I've worked on sequinment at the World Health Organization. But the U.S. has been behind incredibly important activities of WHO. During the Cold War, it was Russia and the United States who got together despite these geopolitical tensions and passed a resolution through the World Health Assembly that eradicated smallpox. So even despite geopolitical tensions in the 50s and 60s, the world moved ahead and eradicated a disease working through WHO. The world is working through WHO on polio eradication, another resolution that was passed by the US being stimulated to do that by Rotary International, which has mobilized over a billion US dollars to contribute to polio eradication. WHO also can work in countries that the US can't work in because of various regulations within the US. By giving its funding to WHO, which is done freely in the past, WHO has been able to work in these countries that are problem countries for US politics, but which are important in the global fight against infectious diseases. So WHO has been a remarkable member, uh, the US rather has been a remarkable member of WHO has been, as has been the UK and many other countries which have contributed both to the core budget through their assessed contribution and also as well through extra budgetary resources provided to specific activities. Without WHO's, without the US's input into polio eradication, for example, WHO will struggle to keep its surveillance activities going, which are necessary to identify where polio is occurring and where it needs to be stamped out. So the US contributions have been in really unimaginable to the general public, but have been basically, along with the UK, Japan, and certain other G7 countries have been the backbone of what you, the United, the World Health Organization has done. But what does it mean going forward? If they're gone, where does that leave WHO, especially if they've been such a backbone? Does that mean the whole thing collapses? Somebody else steps into the void? Where do we go from here? Well, you know, I've always, I've always said in my own personal life that things will go on if I go out and get run over by a bus tomorrow. And I think that's the attitude that we have to have with WHO. If the U.S. does decide through its regulatory, through its parliament or congressional procedures to withdraw from WHO entirely, then WHO will get on with its work without an important partner, but it can be re that partner can be replaced by others. Germany has become a very important partner in global health recently, and other countries are stepping up as well. So as much as it would be terrible if the US leaves WHO and leaves that expertise that it has provided throughout the years, the WHO would continue to function and other countries would likely step in to help support it. Well, do, do you think it might fuel some of the um, moves or murmurings about setting up a, a, another agency to tackle pandemics to cover for WHO's supposed 
failures that without the US inside the WHO, this might pave the way for the setting up of another a competing agency or complement, whether it's competing or complementary. Does this harbinger any of that type of stuff? Well, I, I wouldn't want to make predictions. I don't know what will happen. I can say, though, that um, the, you, there are many countries now which are against setting up, again, new organizations because they're trying to focus what they're doing on a few organizations. And an example would be um, the UN AIDS program, which was set up back in the 1990s. Uh, the US, US UN AIDS program was set up because countries felt that all the UN agencies were not contributing as they should be. And it was set up as an agency independent of WHO, but depending on WHO for certain things and depending on other UN agencies, that organization has now been functioning for 20, 20 some years. And it's not clear what its future will be. I know that many of the partners of UN AIDS would like it to see it now become a, again, a part of various agencies and disband the UN AIDS as it is today, put the biomedical activities back in WHO, the child activities in UNICEF and others, but whether or not that will ever happen, I don't know. But it, there is a precedent for this, but I know that many countries don't want that precedent to continue to set up new agencies. But having said that, if there is an agency that looks like it has a better comparative advantage in dealing with pandemics, then that should be vetted and it should be decided whether or not to move forward in that direction. Well, while you've got a massive amount of experience in dealing with uh, epidemics and pandemics, can you imagine a scenario where there might be a better suited um, structure to deal with this, a better alternative than what we've got? Well, you know, when there is an outbreak that needs international support, WHO is the agency that can not only call together the partners through its global outbreak alert and response network, but that can also facilitate the entry into countries of people who are working with that because WHO has a special relationship with countries and it has offices in those countries. So it is at present the ideal group for getting mobilizing global partners to work when there is a need to work in outbreak management. And that includes new partners such as the Africa Center for Disease Control and other new regional agencies. It's able to pull those partners together and work within countries in a way that uh, um, they can facilitate the entry and the visas of those people who come in to work under the WHO mandate. Okay, uh, thank, thank you for that. Um, just to update everybody, we've heard from Dr. Tedros's office and unfortunately he's confirmed that he will not be joining us today. We're postponing it and we'll put together another event uh, with Dr. Tedros at, at another time. So David, if you're happy to carry on with us, just winging this, regrouping. Yes. Um, I wanted yeah, to go I, on. In, in fact, Emma, I spoke with Tedros on day about another issue. And at that time, he was really looking forward to being able to speak with us today at Chatham House. It's not because he doesn't want to face questions because he doesn't want to be here. I've been in touch with his office today on another issue, not on an issue that he and I began on Monday. And I was told that he has a series of diplomatic meetings today, which is the result of the US withdrawal. So, you know, I think we can all understand Tedro's position. And I am sure that he will participate again in an event coming up, but um, that will be for uh, Robin Niblett and others to be working with him on. And I'm sure that we will have that event possibly this week, possibly sometime in the future. Well, that, that would be great and look forward to uh, uh, taking up the issues with him at that time. Um, so I wanted to come on to the second uh, big news of today in, in, in the pandemic. Um, and that is, <coughs> um, this stuff about uh, airborne transmission and the extent to which, first, first of all, um, it has been mentioned before that it is possible that it can't be ruled out. That's not a new thing. I guess the, the issue is to what extent, how seriously is it being taken as to what extent it's contributing to the spread. So I, I know you're involved in some of the uh, discussions on that. What do we know so far? And if there is, if airborne transmission is more significant than we thought it was, that would appear to have quite a few implications for some of the interventions we're dealing with at the moment. So where are we with this airborne transmission question? 
Thanks, Emma. Um, before we discuss airborne transmission, it's probably useful to understand what types of transmission occur from this virus. And we know that there are two types of transmission. Number one is transmission that occurs by droplets, which are coughed, sneezed, talked, or, or just, or sung. Um, when people make movements with their mouth, they create droplets. And those droplets can infect people directly or they can infect people in a distance of up to um, over a meter, um, a meter maximum, it's thought, um, directly through an aerosol. And an aerosol is when those particles are suspended in the air long enough to go from one place to another. So there's droplet transmission, which is direct, as if someone is spitting on someone else. Then there's the um, aerosol transmission, which is droplets propelled, but propelled in a distance that is a meter uh, so that they can actually land on somebody without direct exposure to the person making those droplets. And then there's airborne transmission, which is a form of aerosolized transmission, but it, it occurs even easier than does this transmission through an aerosol directly to a person. So I don't know if I've been clear on those three types, but what the people who are talking about airborne transmission are talking about now is an aerosol that could be picked up and retransmitted through an air conditioning unit or an aerosol that might go through other means into other parts of, of, of a room or, or a place where people are, are present. And so what we believe is that there is a possibility that there is this airborne transmission in closed spaces uh, that an air conditioning unit, especially one on the wall, might be able to pick up an aerosol and then spit it back out if it's not filtered into the room and circulate it throughout the room. But remember, this is droplets which surround a virus. And if those droplets dry out, the virus can't reproduce, it dies. So the, there have to be several things that happen. That virus has to remain alive during this process because the droplets have to continue to surround it. If those droplets dry out, the virus is, is no longer infectious. So that's the thinking that it might be. And there are some ways to determine this. And there are some studies that are going on now. And WHO is waiting to see these results. One of these is to put a, an animal that can be infected with this virus into various places around rooms in hospitals or wherever to see if those animals are being infected. And that's being done with hamsters. In the past, it was done for tuberculosis with guinea pigs, but hamsters can be infected with this virus. And there are actually cages sitting around in various parts and experiments that are being done by academic institutions that will give us information as to whether or not this virus is spreading in aerosols around in, in airborne transmission further than closed spaces, which is where we believe those that airborne transmission can occur now. Have, have we got any evidence of any cases being tied or uh, suspected of being an airborne transmission or is this all animal studies theoretical stuff? Well, a lot of it's done in laboratories to see how far the virus can be propelled. And those are laboratory studies. That's what they are, laboratory studies. Um, there is um, some possibility, there's some anecdotal evidence, for example, that people sitting in a restaurant in China where there was an air conditioning unit on the wall appear to have become infected and it's not clear how they became infected because they weren't they were spaced they were physically distanced and one of the hypotheses is that this was the air conditioning unit that caused aerosols to be recirculated in the room so that could, that's one hypothesis that exists and that's what people are citing as evidence although there may be more evidence Coming along. We know, for example, in this famous choir episode in the state of Washington, that people were together for two hours when one person was sick. And during that, people, 32 different people, got infected, um, presumably from this person who was is sick, and presumably through aerosols that were created when he sang or she sang and infected the others in the room. Um, there isn't any evidence that there was recirculation in that room, but these aerosols can take. The virus along. And if they then can, again, um, be recirculated, it may be that they can be circulated in a way that infects more people, remembering that those droplets have to remain moist. 
And is, is it a likely scenario or is it kind of way out there that we can't rule out the possibility? I mean... Well, so, some of the reasons are because you can't just look in the laboratory, you have to look in the epidemiology of infections as well. And this infection can be stopped by contact tracing, track and trace, as is being done in the UK, in discrete outbreaks. And countries have shown this time and time again that this can be done, whether it's Germany, which continued this throughout its lockdown procedures, whether it's countries in Asia or elsewhere. So, you know, um, there is evidence in what's happening that this virus doesn't act as a virus that would be airborne, such as possibly influenza, which occurs and doesn't cause discrete outbreaks. So there's lots to be put together yet. And it's ironic that many of the people who signed that letter are actually contributing to many of the different WHO uh, groups which are investigating this. So they're working with the Infection Prevention and Control Group. They're working with other groups, technical groups in WHO to try to understand these ideas and all of a sudden, many of them have felt that they needed to, for some reason or another, be more urgent in what they're requiring rather than working through finding the evidence and using that evidence to create understanding. So epidemiologically, do, do you think that if airborne transmission was a significant, I'm not even saying the major driver, but a significant driver, would, would we not have seen that in, in clusters or... or uh, outbreaks already if that was actually going on? Certainly in countries with low reproductive numbers, and I'm thinking of countries in Europe, for example, um, in Switzerland, which now has a low reproductive number, people are walking around on the streets, they're congregating in restaurants, they're avoiding close distance, they're doing physical distancing. Uh, Switzerland has closed down major public gatherings, a whole series of things, and they're requiring mask wearing in closed compartments such as trains. Yet in Switzerland over the past four weeks, there's not been any indication that this is just airborne and spreading in the community so that if you walk down the street, you could be infected. So there are epidemiological indicators in many countries. I use Switzerland as one example, as places where there isn't this increased transmission that you would think would occur if this is airborne and can infect people walking down the street. So I, I would imagine that, that this story, as, as this unfolds, there may be uh, some people thinking that this will change, again, um, the thinking on mask wearing, that maybe if it's airborne, wearing a mask might protect you from a virus coming in, uh, in addition to you coughing it out. Um, could, could this whole um, airborne transmission story um, reflect on masks, mask wearing, and the very well, politicized yeah. now issue of masks. Emma, airborne transmission would mean that the eyes are even more at risk of being an entry point for the virus. The eyes, the nose, and the mouth are the common entry points for droplets. And aerosolization would be circulating this in such a way, or rather airborne infection would be circulating in such a way that the eyes could be um, even more exposed to the virus. And so if people are walking down the street thinking that a mask would protect them from any type of infection, they've got the wrong understanding. Masks are used to protect others. To protect yourself, you need full PPE. You need to be wearing goggles. You need to be wearing a mask that's uh, got a filter on it. You need to be wearing gloves and you need to be not exposing yourself to this virus in any way. And that's what happens in hospitals. That's why masks prevent people from getting infected in hospitals. But um, walking down the street wearing a mask to think you're protecting yourself is the wrong message that people have understood. The message is protecting yourself involves physical distancing, it involves hand washing, and it involves when you can't physical distance, wearing a mask to protect others. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I'm going to move um, as much as I want to press you even further on this airborne. There's more I can squeeze out of that, I'm sure, but I'm going to give the audience a chance to ask some questions now because a lot of people are waiting. I'm going to uh, start. Um, well, actually, it's a follow up on this for, from Ian Sample at The Guardian um, asking you how might the potential for the aerosol transmission change the strategies for controlling the outbreak? 
that was one of the ones I was going to press you more on. So let's give that to well, you. If there is airborne tr transmission, we need to better understand it before we can put interventions in place. But there is a group of engineers at WHO, sanitary engineers, who are working to understand what the mechanisms might be of propelling these particles, airborne uh, transmission. And, and those things will collect the evidence that we need to decide what needs to be done. But frankly, we're doing quite a good job at present in suppressing this virus, in doing the epidemiological response, which is based on what's happening when the virus gets into people. So that we know that the countries have been successful in suppressing virus transmission. And we also know, as recently in Japan, as recently in China, and in Germany, that this virus can then increase its transmissibility or its transmission in certain areas. And there have to be measures done in that area to decrease transmission. But so, this is a virus we will likely be living with for quite a while. It's not clear what the destiny is, but we need to give everybody the opportunity to pull the evidence together and make the recommendations of what needs to be done. I can't sit here and make them and no one else can either. Sure, but it, in it, if it, let's just suppose we've been through the evidence, no one's saying which way it's gonna turn out, but say it does turn out to be that airborne is significant and we can intervene to, to mitigate that. When there are other viruses that, that are airborne, what are the main differences between a droplet and an airborne in the strategies that you need to take to reduce the risk of transmission? Well, we know that in airplanes, SARS coronavirus itself, the first SARS coronavirus, um, did not transmit through circulating air. It transmitted to people sitting next to or in front of or in back of people who were infected. So we've already got that information on one coronavirus, which granted was a different means of reproduction. It was low in the lungs. This present coronavirus is high in the lungs. We also know that tuberculosis, another infection, does not transmit on airplanes. We know that the filtering systems in airplanes are uh, useful systems which are filtering out those particles if they do get into airborne transmission. What we don't know yet is whether this virus can get into air systems on an airplane or into air systems on um, in um, an air conditioning system in a, in a restaurant, for example, but there's no evidence as yet that shows that it does. And so collecting that evidence over time, maybe doing experiments, maybe putting guinea pigs or, or hamsters rather on airplanes and flying them around with, with airborne transmission might be a way of, of, of showing those things. But these are complex studies which need to be developed in order to understand. And the best is observation. And so observation will tell us now that airlines are flying again, whether or not people are getting infected on airplanes. And it will tell us whether or not people are getting infected in spaced restaurants and areas like that. So we can't just put laboratory studies into operation. We have to put laboratory studies into the hypothesis that is generated by what's happening in human populations. And then we can make recommendations as to how to change that. So it, it would seem that people who are choosing to fly right now with this uncertainty are the guinea pigs in the uh, aeroplane air conditioning system, I guess. What I would say is that those people are um, calculating the risk that they feel might be a risk to them, and they're deciding whether or not to fly. And when they fly, uh, they do what the airline company tells them to do. If it's wear a mask, they wear a mask. So what this whole outbreak is about is understanding your own perception, your own risk. And if you have a risk perception that says that there is airborne transmission, then you should modify your behavior accordingly. There's no evidence of that that WHO has put out yet that shows how you might modify your behavior because WHO is still trying to collect evidence. But if you as an individual, and individuals are at the base of how this outbreak will eventually be contained, if individuals feel that they're at great risk in flying on an airplane for any reason, then they shouldn't fly on an airplane. Okay, um, here's a question, an upvoted question from Adina Mufti. What is the probability that there will be a future virus with the transmissibility of COVID-19 and the fatality rate of MERS? What needs to be done to prevent it becoming a pandemic? Well, I can't answer that question because nobody can predict a pandemic. What I can say is 
that there was in, um, there are four endemic uh, coronaviruses and these have entered populations sometime in the past, probably in much the same way as this <coughs> virus has entered populations, but in a, in a way that they transmitted around the world much more, um, much slow, more slowly. And there's an interesting, um, there's interesting research that's been done on one of these coronaviruses, uh, tracing its rate of mutation back to where it appears to be the same as the virus from which it is thought to have emerged, which is from a, a virus that was carried by cattle. And the, the, this tracing back of the mutations, um, which is done by um, molecular biologists, has taken this to a point in 1890. And during the 18, late 1880s and 1890, there was a major epidemic or outbreak recorded as having killed over a million people. So that's all circumstantial evidence. It's just to show what type of work and research is going on now to better understand these infections. Every endemic infection that humans have likely came from the animal kingdom in some way, whether it was HIV, whether it's tuberculosis, or whether it's the current coronavirus. And so we, we, we know that they've come in the past, and there's no reason that they won't come in the future. And we just have to be prepared for them in a better way than we were this time. These events are, occur when a series of risk factors line up in such a way that this emergency occurs. Those risk factors could be, um, um, for example, um, when there was an outbreak of Rift Valley fever, which is a viral disease infection carried by cattle and transmitted to humans, there was a major outbreak in humans in Eastern Africa back in the 1990s, late 1990s. This occurred because of a series of events. Number one, there was an El Nino event which caused flooding, which caused animals and humans to be pushed closer together on dry land. The virus is transmitted from animals to humans either by their blood during slaughter or by a mosquito. Well, in flooding, there was more mosquitoes. That was a second risk factor. So people were living closer to animals that carried this virus. And in addition, there were more mosquitoes. But the major risk factor was the vaccination of animals against this virus, which was being done in East Africa up until the mid 1990s, stopped because there was no more vaccine available. So all of these things lined up in such a way that there was an outbreak of Rift Valley fever in humans. That didn't spread throughout the world. But that's what we have to be looking at, risk factors, how they line up, and the emergence of an infection. And that can certainly occur in the future. OK, um, I'm going to go on to a politics question now. This is another upvoted question from Patricia Lewis um, from uh, Chatham House. Um, can antibodies from another disease, perhaps from another coronavirus or even a vaccine from an unrelated virus, provide some cross immunity? It's a good question, um, Patricia. And, and it, yes, antibody to some infections do cause cross immunity. In the, corona, the current coronavirus, there are four different human coronaviruses and there are antibodies from all of these viruses. Um, there is one hypothesis in Africa where the outbreak has not been um, increasing in the same manner of, of uh, spreading in the same manner it has in other countries, that possibly there is cross immunity from some of the coronavirus antibodies in people in Africa. This is only a hypothesis. There's no evidence for this at all. But there is cross immunity in some infections and you know there could be cross immunity with this. But recently it's been shown that it might be that the immunity for this virus is not so much antibody immunity as it is T cell immunity, which is a different type of immunity. And if that's the case, then we can't measure antibodies and determine whether or not they're protecting, but there may be other mechanisms of cross protection. Okay, uh, sorry, I've, I've switched around the order of the questions I was gonna ask, because I was gonna ask a politics question. Here's an upvoted, <laughs> politics question from Satwick Maheshwari. The pandemonium this pandemic has caused in international relations and politics has highlighted the fact that we need to have health-centric policies going forward. How can we work towards that? Well, you know, if I were to look at one thing that was really dysfunctional in this pandemic, it's been collaboration nationally between political leaders 
and public health leaders. And that's not been functional in many countries around the world. I'm not naming any specific country, but if you look around, you can make your own judgments. But it's been very difficult in some countries for the public health community to work with, to convince the, the political leaders that certain strategies might be effective. Having said that, in countries where they've taken a more public health approach, an epidemiological approach, they've been able to keep a sustained suppression of the virus. And this includes countries in Asia where they look to see where um, transmission is greatest and then they lock down that sector for a while, then they open it up again with full sanction by their political, uh, with full endorsement by their political leaders or where they have to do other things, but it's always a public health approach rather than a political approach. So if there's one lesson from this, it's, is, it is that public health and political leaders in many countries need to learn to work better together than they are during this pandemic. Well, maybe I could ask you one of the questions I was gonna ask Dr. Tedros, and that, that is a report card for the world on um, global solidarity. Right at the beginning of the outbreak, he talked about the need for scientific, financial, and political solidarity. We've heard a lot about how the scientific solidarity has gone really well, everyone's pulling together, but what would you say is our report card on the financial and political solidarity? Well, you know, political solidarity can be measured in one way by the way the World Health Assembly um, works together. And in the most recent World Health Assembly in May, a resolution was passed with consensus from countries. It wasn't voted on, it was a consensus resolution that there needs to be an examination of the WHO structure and to see how that might be modified. I know WHO will now be required to move ahead with that assessment and it will go ahead with that. So that shows in some way a political solidarity. Um, um, it, including in the US and the US, as I believe, uh, agreed to this resolution and said that they would give a month to WHO in order to determine whether or not this was moving forward in the way they wanted it to move forward. They made an announcement though, almost 10 days or a week after that resolution was passed. So I'm not sure that they were waiting until that full month to see whether or not um, WHO was taking the measures it was obliged to be doing under that resolution. Okay, the, well, there's two similar uh, questions to this that are upvoted. One from Sambal Javed, who's asking, what are some of the lessons learned from COVID-19 on future pandemic handling by WHO and its reform? And from Graham Lister, are there any positive lessons for the reform of WHO emerging from the current crisis? So uh, as you said, that um, assessment will be done and this happens after every big event but so far, what are we seeing that you think uh, might be informative right now? Well, you know, WHO is pulled in many different directions by many different constituencies and by resolutions that are passed in the World Health Assembly. And sometimes WHO has been told to do one thing and then the next year it says, don't do one thing. And, and so WHO is constantly at the, at the whim of the, of the political leaders in the World Health Assembly and must do what they say. It's always, in my view, been a bad idea that a restructuring can be done from top down. What really, in my view, needs to be done is the stakeholders of WHO, whether it's private sector, whether it's civil society, whoever it is, must be working together to really define what functions they want WHO to be doing in the 21st century. And then that those functions would dictate what strategy, what structure should be developed rather than continuing to have a top-down approach to restructuring, which occurred after the West Africa Ebola outbreak. There was a top-down restructuring. WHO created its emergencies program. Based on that, that emergencies program is now being um, criticized by many. And, you know, we'll see another group get together and likely from the top-down impose on WHO a new structure based on what they feel is important without really understanding what functions the stakeholders need and sticking to those functions and then developing a structure based on those functions. So, you know, top-down is always a difficult issue for organizations to face. And many times it happens even when consultancy firms come in to an organization, 
organizing a new structure without fully understanding what the real functions are or what the needs are at a lower level. So is, is there hope that this time any review or assessment could refrain from making those mistakes of top down and approach in a different way, but still have an official review because we're going to have one. Um, that, that sounds not very encouraging if we're going to get more of the same that's not feasible in your view. Is, do you think it's possible to have a review from the top, but uh, not impose a top down restructure? Well, you know, I don't know what WHO will do, but all, all I can say is that for me, structure follows function. And if the functions aren't yet sorted out, because they don't seem to be, because the emergency program created just a few years ago is now the program that people are focused on is needing restructuring. So if it again comes from the top down, it may not be as effective as one that would come from understanding what functions the stakeholders really want, and then moving ahead with a structure that accommodates that. WHO is also a very difficult organization to, to, to work because there are six regional offices, as you know, that are, uh, and the regional directors of WHO are elected by the health ministers in those different regions who then come together in the World Health Assembly and make recommendations in the World Health Assembly. So there are, there are certainly difficulties in the current structure. Many structures have a director general elected by an assembly who then names the regions rather than having those regions elected independently of the director general and at different times than the director general is elected. Um, I'm going to ask a question from Sarah Newley at the Telegraph. Um, and this again is going back to the, the US China thing, but I wanted to kind of add on to that. Her question is, could the US's approach to the WHO result in a surge of influence for China? <coughs> and if so, isn't this the opposite of what the WHO wanted? And, and I'd add to that a question of um, to what extent do individual countries influence what goes on at WHO? Um, you, you could observe that when it comes to being asked about calling out any individual country, whether it's the China or the US or Brazil, or you know, some of the leadership decisions that have been taken in this pandemic, WHO tends to shy away from calling out individual countries. Do you think um, that's true? And second of all, do you, is, are some countries more influential than others in reality, honestly? Well, you know, WHO at the top is a political organization. It was set up as a technical organization a uh, spe specialized organization of the United Nations system. But at the top, it is a political organization and the director general election process is a political process. So, you know, that's the first thing to remember about WHO. The second thing is that countries that provide extra budgetary funding do have an impact on how WHO implements its activities. So if countries are providing extra budgetary funding, that is funding not under their core assessment, but extra budgetary funding for certain activities, then WHO will naturally do those activities because they're bound to do them by that country that has provided the funding. That's why polio eradication is moving ahead with funding from Rotary International, the Gates Foundation, uh, the United Kingdom government and the US government and many other donors because they're providing extra budgetary funding and they say, we want WHO to work in this way to eradicate polio. That has always been a problem for WHO. Of course, any organization would like to be having its money in its core budget and being able to implement its budget based on what, in this case, its World Health Assembly and Executive Board have said should be done. But the priorities are distorted by extra budgetary funding, yet that funding is necessary to keep the organization moving. So it's, that's the, the second issue. The first is a political process to elect a director general. Second process is extra budgetary versus core funding. And the third is um, influence can come from countries in many ways. Countries can sequence staff to WHO to work within the WHO secretariat. Those people work um, on a secondment from their countries but are serving as a link to their countries. 
There are other ways by, by having WHO collaborating centers. The United Kingdom has many, many WHO collaborating centers that provide support to WHO, um, specialized support, for example, in meningitis coming from Public Health England. So there are a whole series of things which countries do in support of WHO, and that does in some ways distort what WHO does. So, you know, when countries step out of both extra budgetary and core funding, there's a place for other countries to come in. And I don't know which countries might come in. Um, Germany is stepping up in certain areas. Other countries may step up. And, you know, I can't predict what China will do any more than anyone else can do. Okay, thank you. So, so uh, apologies, Sarah, I slightly hijacked that, but David did get, get around to answering your question. Uh, fully, I believe. Well, it's a hard question to answer, Sarah. It's a tough question to answer because nobody knows what will happen in the future. But by knowing the ways in which influence can be done, made within WHO, you can envision or you can watch for those things that might be happening as we move so, forward. So maybe a question I was going to pose to Tedros, I could ask ask you, and that is, do do you think that um, WHO was uh, placed in the middle between this struggle between the US and China of what's going on? geopolitically. Yeah. Were they stuck in the middle? Yes, I think are they, they are stuck in the middle. And they're stuck in the middle in many other discussions as well, whether it's between pharmaceutical companies and its World Health Assembly or others. It has to be um, able to um, learn and listen to all sides. And many times in by doing that, it becomes at the center of tensions and discussions. You're muted. Sorry, anyway. sorry, sorry. Um, I'm going to go to another upvoted question now. And this is from Benjamin Stokes. Um, does David have any comments on the percentage of people who get COVID-19 and have no symptoms? 70%, I think, is the figure of the ONS in the UK. And what's the, what is the latest view in light of this of the percentage of people in the UK or different countries who have already had the virus? And any comments on what these facts mean for managing the virus? Yeah, well, there, there are several sources of information about how many people might have been infected in a country. One of those comes from the modelers who look at the evidence they have available and use that to fit into their models to determine what might happen or what might have happened in the past or what might happen in the future. So modelers give us one estimate of how many people might have been infected in a country based on their complex uh, activities. And we heard from our, uh, our modelers last week. In fact, if you want to listen to that, um, uh, Arza was clear in telling how those models are developed. At the same time, we like to use antibodies to determine um, how many people have been infected in the past. And the only standard uh, gold standard test right now is what's called a neutralizing antibody test, which is done in a laboratory and which um, shows that the antibody detected can neutralize a living virus. So that's a very complicated procedure, but that's the neutralizing test that shows that antibody that's present can um, in fact neutralize the virus. What we aren't sure of though is how sensitive these tests are in picking up the virus, the antibody. We know that antibody is difficult to pick up, especially in people who have mild infection or people who have had even serious infections. Sometimes it takes three or four analyses before they, a confirmed um, test, a, a person who had confirmed illness by a PCR shows antibody. Antibodies don't develop until about the second week. But in fact, people, there are a series of people who are being studied who were PCR positive. That means they had the virus present and they're being followed over a series of weeks to see when the antibody develops and when it decreases. And in some of those people who have had good solid infections, they don't have antibody even after four weeks. So it's all about learning. And then there's the T cell immunity in addition, which is making it um, very difficult to understand what immune responses are working and how many people have actually been infected. So there are various figures. I think the generally accepted figure right now is that in some countries, uh, in most urban areas, maybe up to seven to 10% of people appear to have been infected during the highest period of transmission. But in some other areas, it could be up to 17% or greater. So that's a long way around an answer to say what, will, what different answers are. 
And, and there isn't that much certainty. There's a little bit of uncertainty around that, isn't there? Because if the antibodies only last a few weeks, but you're getting your antibody test months later, it could be missing. So it could be a greater proportion than we're seeing. There, there are so many things that could be in the way and explaining confounding factors. Is that Absolutely. Not I would say that for the serological surveys, they're probably not picking up all those people who had infection, but they are picking up a, a good percentage of them. Okay, great. We, unfortunately, we've got, only got time for one more question, and it's a highly upvoted question from Hugh Jenkins. Um, it's a compound question. So it, it appears that the virus gets everywhere, yet China seems to have had remarkably good numbers. Do we therefore expect there is still a significant wave to come in China, or have they really done an exceptionally good job? And the other part of that is, are mortality and hospitalization rates really falling? If so, is this a function of more testing, the virus becoming less deadly or better therapies? So- Okay, um, with the one. first question, um, what was the first question in there again? The first question is about um, the numbers in China look good. Can yeah, we okay. get another wave to come or have they really done a great job? Well, you know, using the term wave is a term that's used in influenza because we're familiar with influenza. It occurs in waves. There can be a, a first wave and then a second wave. And this has happened in pandemics in the past. This virus does not transmit as does the influenza virus. So it's really um, not correct at this point to talk about a second wave. What's more important is to talk about a reoccurrence or a resurgence or a reimportation of virus causing an outbreak. And that's happened in Beijing. That's happened two weeks ago. I was in a discussion with the CDC in China about the Beijing outbreak, which has occurred. Um, it's thought to have occurred um, from another market. It's thought that a market worker there was infected, contaminated the environment. Other people then became infected and it spread out into the community and to other markets that purchased goods from that wholesale market. And so those markets were closed down, schools were closed down in the area and attempted suppression again. That's not a second wave, that's a resurgence. And resurgence is occurring in Germany, it's occurring right now in Japan. It occurred in Singapore when there was a resurgence of virus in a migrant worker population. And so it's more useful to talk about a resurgence and trying to suppress this resurgence in the short term and while waiting for a better longer term strategy that can possibly be better sustained once we know more about the virus and its immune responses. So, you know, speaking of waves is not really helpful. What's more helpful is to look where it resurges and then try to identify whether that virus is the same virus was there before that was there before or not. In the case of Beijing, um, it appears that that virus was not circulating in Beijing before, that it maybe came in from outside, from somewhere else. Um, the second is about deaths, and deaths are decreasing in all countries. They decrease because prevention is occurring, especially among those populations at greatest risk of death, which are those people at greatest risk of serious infection. So seeing a decrease of deaths in the United Kingdom, for example, means that the people who are at greatest risk, those people who are elderly and in care homes, are now being better protected as are people with comorbidities, they're either protecting themselves or they're being protected by other measures and we're seeing a decrease in mortality. So one of the major ways of keeping mortality low moving forward is to strengthen the protection of those people who are at greatest risk, either by self-protection or by setting up mechanisms within care homes and other places where they can be better protected. Thanks, David. And that, um, sorry, everyone, that was all we had time for with the questions. And again, our apologies for not being able to bring you Dr. Tedros. Um, and hopefully we will be able to reschedule for him. And we'll let you know, of course, on that. Uh, but thank you for sticking with us, with David and I today, to discuss these issues. And please come join us next week when we'll be talking with Sir Jeremy Farrer, Director of the Wellcome Trust, about where we are and where we're going uh, with getting decent COVID-19 drugs and other therapeutics. So, Emma, could I, yeah, could I just say one more word that, that we are, I am confident that Ted Rose will speak with us at some point. And, and I think that I, I know the audience must be very disappointed and I'm sorry to have had to fill in, but we will hear his voice at some time in the next few weeks. 
Okay, thank you very much, everyone, and wishing you a great rest of the day.